Alrighty, so let's get right to it. About two years ago I attempted this same challenge in Fallout 3 with an admittedly pretty scuffed rule set to say the least. In that video I made it so no menus were allowed at all, but due to me coming off of Fallout 4 where the player can use VATS without the Pip-Boy, I still allowed myself to use VATS which should have been an automatic fail. So, having had nearly two years to take in the feedback on that run, I think it's finally time to see, can you beat Fallout New Vegas without the Pip-Boy? The answer is probably yes, seeing how many other people have done this before, or something similar, but the best part about a challenge run is seeing how different people tackle the same obstacles. Back to the rules that I mentioned, this time I'm simply not allowed to open the Pip-Boy or use VATS. That means I won't be able to equip weapons or armour, use most healing supplies, change my current quest, and most time consuming of all, no fast travelling. This time I can open menus such as searching bodies and containers, as well as pickpocketing and trading with merchants. A lot of people said that they shouldn't count as part of the Pip-Boy, plus it leaves things more open for different solutions as opposed to just punching or ignoring everything else. Finally, one other rule that I made for myself, I am not allowed to side with Yes Man today. This is just to stop me from meeting all the factions once and hurrying back to proceed with this quest. Now with all that out of the way, let's begin. What's something people really like about New Vegas? Skill checks and quests with multiple solutions because of said skill checks. Well, that's exactly what the crutch of this run is going to be, as seeing how I'm stuck with my bare uninteresting hands for the entire playthrough, I will need to compensate in the damage department by being able to find alternative solutions to quests going forward. With that in mind, my build seemed pretty clear. I max out luck and intelligence for as many skill points as possible, and then bump endurance to 9 for more health, leave strength at 5, and then for once don't drain all the points from charisma, as a slight extra boost to its skills wouldn't be the worst thing this time around. For tag skills I go with science and speech as they will no doubt be the most important two skills of the run, followed by unarmed as in the end I will no doubt still want slash need to kill things so I may as well be slightly proficient at it. Finally for traits I take skilled and good natured for once more extra skill points. Doc Mitchell is kind enough to not only give me clothes but apparently dress me as well and as such I can spend the next 10 minutes with some dignity. Approaching Sunny Smile's training regime will have me automatically equip the varmint rifle, which we do not want to do, so for now I bypass her and head for the cemetery where I grab not only the snow globe, but some of Benny's cigarette butts, just in case I need them for proof later. Somebody in the comments asked a while ago if I could grab these cigarettes and mention them in the video, as not a lot of people know about them, so hopefully this helps somebody who doesn't feel like power leveling speech to persuade Swank at the tops. I have my first taste of combat with some coyotes and while I emerge the victor, I do so with two thirds of my health missing. This makes it pretty clear combat is most definitely not my strong suit today. Some of you may remember that from the Fallout 3 version of this run, that by the end our punches were actually quite devastating thanks to the Iron Fist perk. Well, sadly it doesn't exist in New Vegas, at least for us, so our only hopes of doing more damage is increasing the unarmed skill and potentially the piercing strike perk at level 12. We can worry about all that later, for now we heal up Snuffles, fix the generator, steal ourselves some caps in the mining office and then head towards Hidden Valley. I take the time to very carefully fight and kill all the bark scorpions in the area. They give a decent amount of XP and lead to a very easy first level, I just have to be careful not to get poisoned too much or I will of course die. I drop all of my points into science and then take the swift learner perk, the faster we gain levels the faster we increase our skills after all. With a science skill of 60 we can apply some early game cheese as you all know by now. I use Dobson soon to be bed to heal up and then make my way for the crater near Black Mountain to get the tape that will be our ticket into the Brotherhood Bunker. I tried to fight off the centaurs but my attacks barely phase them so I just let them be as I head up to Black Mountain to phase shift through a door and then make a mad dash to repair Rhonda to complete the crazy 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 quest and get the easiest XP in the whole game. I use my levels to max out science already and grab the educated perk, you know why. Back down to the bunker and the tape allows me access and before long I'm sent out as the Brotherhood's personal assassin to get rid of Dobson. By the way, even though they give you back all of your items after taking them, there is no way for me to re-equip my vault suit, so this is how I'm going to look for the rest of the run. So I somehow briefly messed up this quest. My intentions were to head over to Dobson's bunker and then smash his radio to quickly make him leave. Well I do smash the radio and he becomes aggressive indicating that I did indeed do it, but for some reason when I return to the Brotherhood, this part of the quest is not marked as completed. I sat for a moment pondering how to get out of this situation, considering I am tethered to the surrounding area, lest we want my head to end up in 20 different locations at once. Then, suddenly, I had an idea. Neil's shack, which is still just about in the area, has some grenades sitting on a shelf. If I could take them, I could use them to get rid of Dobson by placing them in his inventory, therefore bypassing the need to equip them in the Pip-Boy. 
Fortunately, Neil's shack was just within range, as the caller was beeping aggressively when I grabbed the grenades, so one quick trip back to our ranger friend, followed by a quick demise after failing to plant the grenade on my first attempt, and bing bam boom, we can enter the bunker and deal with the Brotherhood. My plan is to use their nearly invincible turrets against them, but before doing so, I make sure to rest and let enough time pass for the Elder to leave the first floor. Simply because if he dies in the crossfire, the entire chapter will immediately become hostile, which I of course want to avoid for as long as possible. The turrets, as expected, make short work of all the Brotherhood on the top floor. The only downside was that they killed Knight Lorenzo, and seeing how he is needed for their questline, that automatically fills said questline, and now those on the bottom floor will be out for my blood. Well, thankfully I had already planned for this, by making sure my science skill was maxed out, I can bypass grabbing the keycards, and just hack into the main terminal, and activate the self-destruct codes myself. That means all I have to do is avoid a handful of scribes with combat gloves on my way out, and before you know it, the Brotherhood is dead and buried, and I can continue on with my master plan. Of course, I run through the nearby Black Mountain shortcut for quickness, and then briefly stop off at the Repcon headquarters to simply hack more terminals for easy experience as well as grab some microfusion cells in the matter modulator, which will very shortly be turned into caps at your nearest vendor. I was then going to head off to Boulder City to convince the cans to stand down to get me some good rep with the cans and NCR, when I suddenly decided that I was going to side with House today, and therefore did an immediate 180, and began marching towards Freeside. Like I said, I sell as much as the Vendatron will take, and begin making myself useful to the citizens of Freeside and the Strip. I offered to deal with Oris for the King, and I had planned on blowing him up with reverse pickpocketing just like Dobson, However, in my selling spree moments prior, I sold my second grenade to the Gunrunners. Being far too stubborn to simply buy it back, I went to the Silver Rush and was dead set on just stealing some plasma grenades and mines. However, for some reason, even when I took them into the normally invisible toilets and crouched down, with the doors closed I might add, I was constantly detected. I thought maybe it was just a visual bug, but the immediate colour changing blips in my compass told me otherwise. No matter, I just do things the old fashioned way by agreeing to let Oris escort me, and then using a mix of my intelligence, eyes, and the ability to check for working lungs to determine he is a fraud, and complete the quest that way. As I was at the gate to Vegas, I used my science to deflect the guard's questions, and then met up with Mr. House to figure out how to stop Benny. Well, by now it didn't really matter, as I had more than enough speech to convince Swank to send him to his room for me to take him out. However, even when I had the drop on him, that was easier said than done. Two bullets to my head during the game's opening may not have been enough to kill the courier, but multiple rounds to the midsection sure rectifies that previous blunder. I was convinced that I would just have to keep throwing myself at him like this until I got lucky, which I thought I did on this attempt when he stopped firing and I began beating up his shoes. Unfortunately, he came to his senses and put me down shortly after. After some field attempts, it finally occurred to me to just steal his ammo, which sure enough works, and now things are much more my speed. He may still pack a punch, but unfortunately, when it comes to CQC, I've got the upper hand. He attempted to use a tire iron he found at one point, but all it did was delay the inevitable, and before long, one final punch knocks him down for good, and I celebrate the murder by getting myself banned from all of the casinos on the strip. I return the MacGuffin chip to house so that he may finally reveal the secret that he's been sitting on for 200 years. The Securitrons can now fire missiles. Neat. My next task for the man is to head all the way over to the fort and activate the secret army there. That's a lot of walking that I don't exactly want to deal with right now, at least without a few more levels, so I briefly take a break from the story to do some side questing. First up, if you can believe it or not, is going to Gamora and helping out Juana and Carlitos with their distant lovers ordeal. Even if I wasn't a wet noodle in terms of combat, this entire quest is just a lot of walking back and forward between Gamora and the Vault 21 Hotel as I relay information between the two of them. It ends with me getting the help of the Super Beard Brothers and escorting the disguised Joanna to Freeside, where we are jumped by some of the Omertas. In a past life, I saw how poorly the situation can play out, so I convinced them that this was all done with the knowledge of their bosses, and they back down. Joanna and Carlitos leave, and as a reward, give me information that allows me to start the Omertas quest for House early, before he even asks. So, I go and... help... the Omertas. Ugh, I think I just threw up my mouth a little bit. Despite my normally aggressive ways towards these individuals, I do know how to very quickly fly through their quest. I steal Kachino's book and rub it in his face, and from there convince Troik to not only turn on Nero and Big Sal, but to dispose of the weapons himself with the thermite. Then, as for Clandon, well, he's kind of an asshole and I lack the necessary skill set to pick open this lock, so I just pummel him into a much deserved grave that would usually be filled with a lot more pinstriped suits by now. With that, it's time to meet the bosses, but I also convince Kachino to do the fighting for me as well as using my silver tongue on Sal to make him believe Nero was double-crossing him, 
In the ensuing chaos, Nero kills Sal and Kachino, as they are both idiots, and then I kill Nero with my bare hands. This completes the quest, and while I may not be able to kill all the murders today, we can at least take something from the fact that they now have no leadership and will soon descend into chaos. Now, not to skip over a lot of content, but I'm going to skip over a lot of content. I did every single major side quest and free side that I could think of, from helping out the guards with their escort and debt problems, sometimes with explosive results, to settling the disputes between the kings and the NCR, and even helping out Julie Farkas with the drug issue in Freeside by having the followers and Garrett's set up a working business partnership. By the time I'm done, I've reached level 12, maxed out my unarmed skill, and I have the piercing strike perk. In terms of levels and perks, that's about as ready as I'll ever be, but to add some extra defense to my kit, I take my winnings from the casinos and turn them into cybernetic augmentations down at the New Vegas Clinic. I get both the regeneration and subdermal armor implants, along with the implants to increase my strength and endurance by one point, bringing them to 6 and 10 respectively. I begin heading southeast to Cottonwood Cove, but let's be real, I get distracted quite a bit along the way, so here's what I got up to. First of all, I ended up in Boulder City to sell that whole dispute without bloodshed for even more XP. On my way out, I was then approached by a demon, who I quickly put in his place with some punches, as well as some covering fire from the nearby NCR, who also wanted in on the action, I guess. Passing by the child of the mysterious stranger, I decided to put my newfound punching prowess to the test by facing off against some of the fire ants. Just like in the new healing run, the NCR radio ranger appeared like a guardian angel to lend a hand. He certainly helped to mitigate damage, but in the end he was momentarily bested by the creatures. I was able to fend off the surrounding ones by myself, and was able to carry him back to safety when I then left him to heal from his wounds. Some of you are probably trying to convince me he's dead, but that's nonsense. Would a dead person be hardy enough to give you a thumbs up like this? Yeah, I don't think so. Feeling good about having some decent weapons, I proceed to test them out even further on the nearby Vipers. You know, the ones with the grenade launcher that try to cripple you in your first playthrough. Well, needless to say, they will be the ones with destroyed bones this time around, as I just completely negate any and all of their armour. As I am on good pace for Cottonwood Cove, I briefly stop off in Novak to learn the Ranger takedown from Andy, just in case it proves useful, and then continue on my merry way. I should probably mention this, no, companions technically don't break any of the rules of this run, but I just didn't feel like bringing any of them along this time. Ironic that I bring this up when in the vicinity of Boone, as he is the only one I wouldn't be able to take, as you need to equip his beret to complete his quest. On the final stretch to the cove, and I have some more encounters that test the limits of my strength. Golden geckos? No. Mole rats? Yes. Glowing ones? Also no. Next time, I didn't see the glowing one, but there was a rat scorpion which was easy enough to dispatch, so that made me feel good. Taking the barge up the river, and before I meet Caesar, I fight in the three rounds of the arena. Even with almost no points in melee weapons and only a slightly above average strength, I am still able to beat all three of them within a matter of minutes. Also, for anyone unfamiliar with this, the machete and armour is equipped automatically when you start each fight, and is then removed once you are victorious, so there's no need to open the pit boy but also no way to keep the machete equipped after the fact. I talk with Caesar, who isn't best pleased about the whole of murders thing, which is odd as he has never said this to me before, despite the countless times they have died at my hands. Fortunately, he can take a joke, I guess, as he lets it slide and orders me down into the bunker to deal with what's down there. I of course agree, but not for him. Once more, the science skill comes in clutch as I can deactivate the protectrons and turrets, which allows for a much easier experience. I do still destroy all of the protectrons though for the crumbs of XP they give out. I shouldn't be this desperate, but for some reason I am. That said, it is actually enough to level me up while I'm down here, and now I start funneling some of my points into sneak. At the time, I wasn't sure where to put them. Truth be told, survival would have been the better choice, as I only just now remembered about the Rad Child perk, which gives you a passive healing effect that stacks the more lethal your levels of radiation. Considering defense isn't one of my best strengths right now, having a strong passive healing on top of the regeneration implant would be perfect. To get the Rad Child perk, I need 70 in survival, so for the next few levels, that's where all of my points are going. I return to Caesar once I've activated the army, as he just assumes the shaking ground means I followed his orders. With my business at the fort concluded, it was back to the cove where I used my heart instead of my head, and freed the Weathers family for almost nothing after convincing the owner that they were all diseased. Now, while I could just head back the way I came, I instead opted to go back through Camp Searchlight towards Nipton, and then back up to Good Springs in the Black Mountain shortcut. With the help of the turrets and blunt force trauma, I was hoping I would have enough time to deal with the ghouls in Searchlight, so that I could bring their dog tags back for rewards. Unfortunately, without any rad resistance, I just didn't have the time, and only managed to get half of them. On the bright side, I now have the maximum level of radiation sickness, so I am prepared for when I get the rad child perk. Silver linings and all that. <laughs> Making my way through Nipton, I get the alternate dialogue with Volpes due to already meeting him on the strip prior, and from there continue going back the normal way, where I demonstrated the effectiveness my level 13 fists have on beginner-friendly jackals and ants. 
Well, if I'm going to be slaughtering ants, I may as well get rewarded for my efforts, so I head on over to Jackson at the Mojave Outpost and see about clearing out the ants on the highway for him. They all go down easy enough. As per usual, the XP and reputation increase are the real rewards here, as I can't do anything with the weapon and ammo that he gives me. I would say I could sell them for caps, but even after the implants, I have more than enough of those. Anyway, I turn in the quest at the outpost, which allows me to level up and continue putting points into survival, where on my next level, I will have enough points to take Radchild as planned. I take out any and all convicts and vipers in my way, that also includes those in the Bison Steve, so that I may rescue Beagle, and promptly put Prim Slim in charge of the town to quickly finish that quest. It was around here as I was making my way towards Good Springs where I finally realised how easily I could have done the Ghost Town gunfight quest. Sure, approaching Sunny has me automatically equip the Varmint Rifle, which is much less than ideal. However, while I can't open the Pip Boy to unequip it, I can just head over to Chet and sell it to him directly from my hands, to be rid of it that way, and allow me to put my hands to use once more. On the topic of being able to use things from my inventory without opening it, thanks to my maxed out science skill, I can now make auto-inject stim packs at workbenches, assuming I have a sensor module, and either type of the stim packs. Naturally, I make as many as I can. While I have been getting by without them, having some will allow me to engage in tougher fights, without feeling entirely hopeless from now on. Anyway, as expected, I steamroll my way through the defense of Good Springs, and now it's back to Vegas to get my next assignment, which is of course, getting the assistance of the boomers. Before doing that though, I make my way back to Cerulean Robotics, as I know from the previous New Vegas run that this place is littered with sensor modules, and considering I'm heading for Nellis, having as many healing supplies as possible isn't the worst idea in the world. I can craft just over 15 stim packs in total, which is certainly much more than the zero I thought I was going to be working with, and with a brighter future ahead, I make my way for the boomers. I use the normal strategy of just waiting in the first house until the sky stops trying to kill me, and then proceed into the base. Thanks to science, once again, along with 65 in repair, that I literally got just for this, I can repair the solar panels for Loyal, as well as use a sonic emitter to deal with the ants. I then put my patience and checks to use once more, as I listen to Pete's story, and ask him just enough questions to become idolised, and now, right before I raise the bomber, I murder Loyal with a well-placed fragmine in his pants, followed by beating an alerted Pearl and her guards to a pulp. Yeah, there's no way to raise the bomber if I cannot open my inventory to equip Loyal's detonator, unfortunately. Still though, I wanted to do as much for them as I could before destroying their entire chain of command. Escaping the base would have been a nightmare if it wasn't for the auto-inject stim packs. Honestly, without them, I don't even know if I would have been able to escape outside of blind luck. Back at Vegas, I watched Securetron attempt a moonwalk before being tasked with presidential protection duty. Remember, since I already blew up the Brotherhood bunker and dealt with the Omerdas, I have basically just jumped straight to the endgame. On the way to Hoover Dam, I made sure to mark a few locations on the map to get me just enough XP to reach level 16, and finally take the Radchild perk. I get to see it in action pretty soon. When saving Kimball's life, I make sure to go up and take the detonator from the Legion disguised engineer, as well as disarming the bomb on Kimball's vertebrae. Once that's done, I head over to the sniper tower, where I am unfortunately a few seconds too late to save the ranger. No matter, I get his much needed revenge by swapping out the assassin's belt for an explosive. I was perhaps a little too close to said explosion, as it ended up hurting me and crippling my legs in the process. At least this lets us see the Radchild perk in effect, and, as you can see, it heals me pretty fast. Especially at max radiation sickness, along with a regeneration implant. Unfortunately, it cannot fix broken limbs, so I'll still need to watch out for those. Well, with the assassins out of the picture, the president is saved, and now I can return to the strip yet again, only to be told to go all the way back to the El Dorado substation. I'm going to skim by all of this, except for this part, where I got jumped by Legion assassins. Well, I don't really have any other opening strategies that doesn't involve just rushing them down, so I just start throwing hands. The piercing strike perk may allow me to completely ignore all of their armour, which is good, but using your fists without any type of unarmed weapon is still a struggle, even with the skill maxed out. The rat child perk, in conjunction with the auto inject stim packs, keeps me alive long enough to take out the first assassin, and then gives me ample time to run for the nearby bridge, where I can hide from the others as I let the Radchild do its thing. Once I'm back in fighting shape, I can slowly begin picking off the second assassin, who I'm able to stun lock a few times, which is much appreciated. I then heal on top of the bridge for a moment, and while doing so, I believe the Legion troops were attacked by a caravan, or at least that's what I gathered from this new corpse. Once I'm healed, I finish off number 3, and then approach and deal with number 4, as he was currently fighting the game's engine. It works for me, so I bully him to the grave, make it to and activate the substation, return to house, and then proceed to the final battle. The minor issue with weapon restrictions during the final battle is there is no reason for me to engage the enemy, especially in a scenario like today, where I have the support of the Securetrons and the NCR. That said, I do still get my hands dirty, I like punching people, what can I say? 
making it to the Legates camp and things are off to a bit of a rough start when the very first Praetorian ends up crippling my head. It's not the worst thing in the world to be fair, but it is very annoying. The fight between us was almost evenly matched though. If I was able to block his attack I could follow up with a couple of punches that could either stun or disarm him, leading to more follow ups. If I was quicker I probably could have grabbed his gauntlet when I disarmed him, but sadly that was not the case. If he did manage to land a quick hit on me though, it would be devastating. See the crippled head again as proof. But patience would allow for the rad child to heal me back to full health in a matter of moments. The fight takes an odd turn as it ends in a stalemate in a way that could only happen in New Vegas. He somehow glitched himself in this rock and couldn't escape. Well, there's nothing to be done about that I suppose. You may be wondering why I spent longer than normal going over a fight with a single Praetorian, and the reason is pretty simple. Attempting to fight Lanius multiple times, even in a 1v1, always led to an unsurprisingly fast death. It didn't matter if I blocked, ran or used the crates that have saved me on multiple occasions, he would always slaughter me within seconds. It didn't help matters that I forgot to take the stonewall perk to prevent him from knocking me down, but to be honest I don't think it would have made much of a difference at the end of the day, he just would have killed me while I was standing up as opposed to being ragdolled. So after a few attempts I just anticlimactically talk him down, and then for once I actually did the same thing to Oliver. Not sure if I've ever done that in the video before. Anyway I approach house, finishing the game and proving yes you can indeed beat Fallout New Vegas without the Pip-Boy. As I said at the beginning, one of the best parts of New Vegas is just how much you can use the skill checks to bypass multiple situations, so having a run based primarily around that concept due to limitations was a hell of a lot of fun. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like and you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe. Try to have one of these videos every week. My name is Nervous, I see everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.